part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Look up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's... This is Jason J. Lewis, the voice of Superman on Justice League Action. This is Mark Wade, writer of Superman Birdwine. You're listening to The Krypton Report. So Case and I are back, and this is just a we're having some technical issues, but I have Mr. Case Aiken from a from another Superman podcast, and we're here to talk Superman stuff. <laughs> yeah, and it's a good era for Superman type stuff. Uh, so as you mentioned, I'm from the Men of Steel podcast, which is for Superman and Superman adjacent material. Uh, so of course, I've been following all the stuff that's been going on in the comics and, and the shows and, and whatnot. So uh, very excited to talk about both a retro show today, but also talk about a show that just wrapped up its third season. Yeah. It, it's, it's very nice because you know, what's weird about the Ruby Spears show is like, it's the cartoon that everyone forgets ever existed. Yeah. Cause it's only 13 episodes and it just kind of gets, you know, I've told the story before where I was at target one day and I saw it. And it was like $5 for the DVD set. But I didn't realize it was what it was. I thought it was the old filmation that I had a season of, you know, because it was packaged weird. And then later I learned, oh, it's this Ruby Spears that was kind of this weird in-between cartoon series. And this was, I don't know, it's been maybe like eight years or something since that. But it's weird. Yeah, it, it like... um the reason why I was excited to talk about it is because it's a show I be I binged for the first time, like last year, maybe two years ago at this point, uh, because it was just totally off my radar as a Superman fan and as an animated series fan in general. And also someone who was like in the exact age range when this show was out that I should have been watching it. Yep. Uh, I, I'm 39 now. So just like frame of reference on this one in this team, this is what, 89 when yeah. the show was out. So I'm 38. So like I'm in, I'm in the same boat with you. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it's so weird because I, once I binged it, I was like, oh, you know what? I've actually seen clips, and specifically, I saw the Wonder Woman episode of the show, so I was mm-hmm. like already aware. I was like, okay, yes, there are things I saw. It just wasn't like on regular rotation on TV when I was at the spot watching it. <laughs> you know, like whatever network it was on or whatever, I just missed it when it aired, and it didn't have like a lot of reruns. Yeah, it, it's like I said, it's one of those that kind of gets forgotten, and what's even weirder is my friend Anthony talked about it on a show, just his digging for kryptonite. And the funny part was the Ruby Spears series at the time was on Tubi. And I was like, yay, Tubi. And now it's not. Mm. So we champion Tubi when Tubi, you know, doesn't let us down. Yeah. The, uh, the, the the streaming situation right now is really frustrating for a lot of that kind of content. Like DC just announced they're, they're pulling a DC superhero girls uh, from, from max. And it's like, that's, that's just frustrating. Like, yeah. <laughs> like the, we, we were sold on being able to watch anything anytime. And now it's, it's way more restrictive than even that. And that's why I go back to saying, I just bring back DC universe. I loved it. Right. I was like, I'll pay 10 bucks a month for DC universe just to have all my DC stuff in one place that I'm paying for instead of them selling it off is what they're doing. Yeah. They're selling it off to other streamers. And I'm like, now we're going backwards to where we were. So Right. I, DC Universe was such a great app. When when Men of Steel launched, it was th- it was the height of or not the height of it was the like right around the time that DC Universe launched. And so there was a lot of times where we would just be like, we need an episode. What random documentary or special features video or whatever was up on there that we could watch? So it was like, here's the Science of Superman featurette that like came out alongside Superman Returns or here, yep. you know, or, or there's all this material you could just easily access because it was all all the DC content and only that. And like, I admit from the standpoint of a consumer doesn't make a lot of sense (laughs) like in terms of subscriptions uh, just for, for the general mass market audience. But for us nerds, uh, like like us comic nerds, it was perfect. Yeah, it was perfect. I mean, it just really kills me because just like in the same thing you were saying, we had planned on doing, you know, the the adventures of Superman was there. Superboy was there stuff that had never really streamed before. Now all that's gone. Yeah. The Legion of superheroes cartoon. Yep. Which, uh, so yeah. We were actually in the process of reviewing that when DC universe, everything moved to max and it wasn't there. Right. So then James and I both just bought the Blu-ray set. 
So we it's just back to buying physical to have. Yeah. But okay, we're going to get into this. So the first thing I'm going to ask Mr. Case about here is we have a new Superman and new Lois cast. What are your thoughts on this for Superman Legacy? Okay, so let's start with Lois. Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is amazing as a, a, a Lois Lane analog here. Uh, it's incredible casting for Lois. I think that that's pretty much perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's funny is when they said that she was testing, I was waiting until they were, they got down to announcing who was testing before I did my, oh, I'm going to watch stuff to check out these people. And that show had always been on my radar, something to watch. And I watched the pilot. My wife came in and caught the end of the pilot. And we are now in the almost done with season three. <laughs> so that has become me and my wife's show to watch. Yeah, it's it, like like it's the right kind of vibe for a very classic style Lois, and I think that that's just perfect. And and she she knows or she can totally do sass. We haven't actually said the name. It's yeah. uh, uh, Rachel Brosnahan. Yes, uh, <laughs> but most people know her from Marvelous Miss Maisel. Um, but she can do sass. She can be this kind of like charming, you know, like uh, transatlantic kind of accent type character, and I think that'll just be perfect. Yeah, I mean, she has done, like, impressed me, and I've loved it. Uh, and, yeah, uh, so her, when they announced that she was testing, she was the one I was like, please get it, please get it, please yeah. get it, please get it. Um, so what about any familiarity with David? David Corin Sweat? Uh, I, no familiarity aside from, like, people have shown like, oh, he was in this thing. It's like, oh, okay, he was in a thing that like, he was a background character, things like that. I d did not stand out to me in any way uh, at all. Not even positive. I've seen like the episodes of shows he's been on. Um, but uh, I will say he looks like a perfect mashup. If you did like one of those like face apps that like combine actor faces of taking Tom Welling and uh, Henry Cavill. Yeah. So it's just <laughs> like, it's kind of perfect. And then, then he's got kind of like the, a little bit of the lankiness of like a Chris Reeve. So uh, in terms of casting for Superman looks the part, <laughs> right? He looks the part, you know, um, if you're going with the title of Superman legacy, you know, Kind of, kind of fits that whole legacy idea right there. Yeah. Um, I so the only thing I've watched him in so far, I'm gonna watch the mini series on Netflix called Hollywood. People say that he's great. That I watched Pearl, and he had a small role in Pearl. Um, he was one. I guess he's one of the main characters. There's not many people in that movie. Um, so that's where I watched him, and I was like, okay, cool. And the cool thing is, is he has that chance, much like Henry Cavill did. Where and Brandon Routh, to be honest, where I don't know them from anything else, really. You know, well, and Chris Reeve, for that matter. Well, I mean, when I growing up, he was just Superman. You know, sure, so, but I mean, for the mass audience, yeah. So it it works to just be okay. It's Superman, not like it's this person playing Superman. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And what's funny is, so we both told our ages, and I I I, I recorded this little tidbit where I said, "This is the first time that a Superman's being cast." that is like significantly younger than me. Right. <laughs> like when Tyler Hoechlin was cast, he's two years younger than me. That's not a big deal. Okay. That's in the same bracket of age, whatever. Yeah. Know? Like if we hit the gym really hard, we could have also been up for the same part. Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? If I had time, I have kids. Um, And then Henry Cavill's two years older than me, you know, when he was cast now, David's like 29. So I'm like, yeah, Superman is now younger than me. Yep. Yeah. It's a weird element of uh, just, just the property getting older <laughs> and all that. Um, but it's cool because I'm, I'm excited. I don't know if you saw our little video. Um, <clears throat> my son and I made a big like box and decorate with like Superman stuff. It's the legacy box where we're putting change and money and stuff in to save up to buy merch. <laughs> when so <Superman>. nice. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like, I was telling him about how, like when Superman returns came out, when Man of Steel came out, how there was all this merch and how excited I was. So I'm like, we're going to start saving now because now I have kids. So now it's like, okay, you're getting this new toy. You're getting this new shirt. You're going to get curtains, bedding. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're going to decorate. <laughs> 
yeah, that's always like kind of the, the side thing that's so cool about like when these big media properties come out for, for the characters. Like right now, uh, obviously Across the Spider-Verse just came out and all of a sudden there's like all this Spider-Man merch and specifically like Spider-Man merch for characters that no one would have talked about before. Like I recently bought like the Scarlet Spider hoodie and yes. it's like, it's not just like a costumey kind of shirt and it's not, and it doesn't have the sleeves attached to it. It's like the proper full hoodie, uh, sleeveless and all. And it's like, oh man, the fact that I can just buy this now is great. Thank you. Thank you. Spider verse for existing. So that some of the, like my middle school, uh, like comic book nerd can actually like finally own some of the, the, the stuff that I've yeah. just always wanted. And thanks to like popularity by way of increased, you know, availability. Uh, it's, it's actually there. I'm with, I'm with you. Scarlet, I love Scarlet Spider. I don't even know why. I think it was just something cool. I have a whole story I've told before about going with my dad to the uh, uniform shop. My dad was in the Navy. He was a CB. And uh, he, there was this one shop that he would go buy stuff for his uniform, and they had a spinner rack. And he got me this one Spider-Man cosmic, and it was um, Spider-Man the Scarlet Spider. It was after the Clone Saga. <clears throat> and I didn't know who it was, so it was just this really cool, and I still have it, um, comic. I love it. And so I've always had a special place for Scarlet Spider. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not like it's kind of a Joe character in in retrospect now because the Clone Saga has such a bad rep, and just the name long. the Scarlet Spider is a rough name to really pull off, um, especially when the character has a pretty large percentage of his costume that's blue. Uh, like the hoodie I'm talking about is yeah. just is just blue, and I'm like, oh, it's from the Scarlet Spider. People are like who don't know who the character is, just kind of like cocks their head, and I'm like. It, it's spider-man and they're like oh okay cool yeah <laughs> like, uh, it's the but, scarlet spider-man right um uh, i when the uh they first put out ads for the character uh coming back because he he had first shown up as like just the clone had returned in the story arc and it was cool that he came back that way but the ads were like return of the exile and i thought he was going to be called the exile mm. um and i was like this costume's uh, is so dope and like the exile is a cool name and like you know then they they name him scarlet spider and like They've never not joked about that in the actual book. Like at no at no point has anyone ever thought that was a serious name. Um, it's just funny that that's the name that stuck. Yeah. Good old Ben Riley. Yeah. Oh, well. But it's just awesome that, like you said, we have this merch for everything. So I'm, you know, I'm excited for, I'm excited for my kids to get caught up in the hype of Superman, like I did for Man of Steel and for Superman Returns. So I, I'm, you know, looking on the positive. I'm always got to be hopeful and optimistic, you know, for the future. So yeah, I mean that's part of being a Superman fan, right? Exactly. If if you're not, then what the heck? So the other thing I was going to ask you before we dive into more of this Ruby Spears is you mentioned your podcast is doing all kinds of stuff for the anniversary of Man of or not Man of Steel of the death of Superman. Did you see that McFarlane is putting out a Doomsday for Superman set? Um, I saw that it was happening. I haven't actually seen pictures of it. Oh, I should have sent you one. There's, there's like, like two pictures, like just the the action shot of the toys being posed, and then like them in the box. Um, it looks cool. Here's a spoiler alert for our listeners. I'm gonna buy two of them. One for me, and <laughs> Solomon's getting one for Christmas. Um, because he wants one. He loves Doomsday for some reason. And uh, my kids, I actually made a a video I edited together every doomsday for Superman fight in one video. And I even threw in like a, a battle scene of doomsday from Krypton, the TV show. Oh, nice. Um, so it's some of them are the full fight. Some are just clips. So from like justice league, um, the little part from the Superman 75 anniversary cartoon from, uh, Justice League Unlimited, I think, as well, and then just the different animated movies, and then of course the live action stuff. Right. So, and it, it yeah, was, now I'm looking at a picture of the the figures now that they're uh, very cool looking. I they, the only complaint, if I have to say one, is I wish Doomsday was a little bit bigger. Like if if you're familiar, even more with, so. Yeah, like if you're familiar with the McFarlane figures, like my wife got Swamp Thing because my wife is dope, and that one's like huge, like it's the biggest one. But like the Killer Croc or the more recent like Dark Side are bigger, but they're not super huge. I kind of wish Doomsday was right in there, um, just a little bit bigger. But it's all good. Yeah, he does look bigger than the um, like I have the 
Superman fighting the Batman Doomsday from Death Metal. My wife got that for me for Christmas two years ago. And I've seen pictures of the comparison. So he is bigger than this figure I have. So we will. Okay, still, it's, it's cool just seeing like, I mean, for a character that's at, like, frankly, as toyetic as Doomsday is, mm-hmm. you know, it's such, like, it's all about the visual and then like the spiky bits, which, you know, represented in plastic are, are going to be cool looking. And you can like set up some really co- cool poses. Like mm-hmm. looking online right now, I'm seeing a bunch of like really cool kind of like positionings of the figures. I'm like, oh, yeah. All right. Nice. This is. Yeah. This is good. Yeah. Uh, all we need is that like war world version of Superman to like go up against him. And it's like a, a really cool epic monster versus like gladiator kind of fight scene. Mm. Uh, but even just the classic Superman is, is going to look awesome. It, it, however you pose it on your shelf. Like, it is weird that the figure isn't based more like the gladiator where the, he doesn't have a shirt, you know, and it's just like torn or like more of a torn shirt focusing on that. Like last couple pages of the battle. Yeah. So, but there's been another battle case. Have you been watching Superman and Lois? Yes, I have. And I was, I I was curious if we're going to get into how that video you made probably needs to be updated with some additional footage. No, no, I made it afterwards because you got it right after. Nice. Because Solomon sat and he watched Superman and Lois with me on that. And he was like, wow, like he was into it. I mean, wide eyed sitting there between me and my wife, just like, holy cow, like. And we started talking about it. And then as soon as the video was over or the episode was over, I pulled up and showed him the battle from Smallville. And he was like, what? I'm like, yeah, son. Yeah. Things have changed a lot. Um, and then that's what kind of prompted me to make the video of all the different things and put them all together in one place. Um, let's just say he so much was into it that yesterday he had his phone, which is my extra old phone that he uses like a tablet. Uh, my iTunes up and he was listening to Soundgarden blow up the outside and he was playing with superman and doomsday toys (laughs) so i was like i'm so proud of you child yeah so when i I wasn't exactly watching like tracking which episode i was at and when i got to the manheim episode uh so when Mm -hmm. we got to the end of that arc where we we dealt with manheim and his wife and the episode ends with was Bizarro waking up in the basement. Um, that felt like it could have been the season cliffhanger because the majority mm-hmm. of the plots of the season had been wrapped up. The ones that hadn't been are ones that could carry over to the next season without it being the end of the world. And then we get the Luther stuff in the last two episodes leading into the actual confrontation with <laughs> with Doomsday Nay Bizarro. Um, or Nay Bizarro, whatever the, <laughs> the maiden name yeah. thing is. Uh, which, you know, was... It, it it was interesting that they did all the stuff that we were expecting from, you know, BVS in terms of how they would have transformed a Kryptonian into a, into a, uh, a doomsday type entity. Um, and instead it's like, all right, well, we'll we're going to jump into this to sort of launch the next season. However, that's going to like, you know, open and then conclude the, the arc for all these characters. Yeah. I mean, totally. I mean, you know, the way that they brought back Bizarro, I was thinking, okay, now we're going to get more of like the mindless, just zombie bur- Bizarro, you know, like, bleh, bleh, like kind of thing. And you know, what's its purpose going to be? Like, then we saw something kind of grow and mutate. And I was like, Is it, what are you going to do? You know, because the show has been really good about subverting expectations. Right. It, it was interesting so. because, again, they, they referenced Doomsday when they first introduced Bizarro. And then they like came it around or came like brought it around full circle when they rolled out like this iteration of doomsday, which I I'm generally pretty good with like the whole, like Lex Luthor murdering him like crazy to get his, you know, aggression out and like jabbing him with like X kryptonite shards so that we get the spikes that we get all these elements. Um, I will say it took me just a little too long for it to click the phrase. Every time you die, you come back stronger. Um, for whatever reason in my head, I was thinking about <laughs> Saiyans from Dragon Ball Z. And then once the first spike went in, I was like, oh, I, I, never mind. Sorry, I'm dumb. I should have seen that coming. Yep. My wife goes, are they, is he going to be doomsday? And I'm like, just not saying anything. She's just looking at me wide eyed. Like, I'm like, let's just, let's just watch. Yeah. <laughs> um, You know, and I, I made this. Okay. So I put this comment up online and no one really commented on it, but that happens. I said, you know, what's interesting is thinking of doomsdays that we've seen in live action and everything. 
this doomsday and Smallville's doomsday are the most dangerous. Now I say this because in the comics and on Krypton, the series they did where once doomsday dies, they would then uh, clone him. And so that he can't die that way again. But on here and on Smallville, we saw him die. Then he came back to life, not able to die that way again. So it's like, how do you officially kill him then? And stop. Right. Him? See yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. They're doing exactly the, th uh, the, the thing from the comics, but not, or like the later version of him from the comics. Um, yeah. So instead of like you taking the corpse, cloning the corpse and doing it again, you know, kind of thing. Um, it, they're just kind of speeding it. I have my theories how Hilba stopped. I have my theories, but I'll save those. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how are you feeling about that cliffhanger? Just having doomsday while you are covering so much content dedicated to the death of Superman. Well, I mean, it, it if it had dropped like a month earlier, we probably could have snuck it in as being part of that coverage, but we had like just moved on from it <laughs> right, right in time for that episode. See, if they had just never taken breaks. Yeah. Been okay. Um, yeah, I, I like the look. Um, I, I, I thought that they did a really good job. I mean, Superman and Lois is like this interesting relationship with special effects. Like you can tell the things that they can do cheaply or easily. Like the, the Superman landing is a, a really good example. Like they definitely have like that after effects file queued up for every time the character needs to like pop mm -hmm. in. Um, which is why he's rarely just like floating. He usually like arrives with like a, a thud with a superhero landing. Um, yep. And I, I feel like the effects were pretty good here. Like, it still looks like CGI. Um, and, and I don't think that any, any of us were expecting it to look particularly different. Um, it, it doesn't look like a movie quality CG monster, but it looked. I, I thought it looked pretty good design-wise. I thought that the effect was pretty good. It, there are moments where it's like, well, why is he so aggressive towards Superman specifically? Because, like... That Bizarro kind of like Bizarros tem tend to have like redemption arcs, and we saw that that Bizarro innately wasn't a bad guy. He just was, you know, in a fucked up situation. Um, so it's mm -hmm. sort of its own. I just take it he got he was well, killed. yeah, exactly. He came back and he was like then eating he was... rats and stuff in the in the basement. So yeah, he was brought back to life through some sort of super science. His mind's already messed up from that, whatever they did to him. And then my wife pointed out that Luther's kind of power that we saw set up is that he gets into your head. And twists it. So he's already being killed over and over again. And being twisted by Luther. So. You know. Whatever. It works. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I liked the whole sequence with that. I liked I, I liked how they set up this Luther. I, I was a, a fan of this style. I, I don't necessarily want it to be every version of Luther going forward. But I right. thought for this show. Specifically that they're going to try to do something different than the, the Luther that we got on Supergirl. Or all the other versions of Luther that we've gotten. Um, it, it was an interesting, different take than what we've seen before. I just, I want when season four starts, I want a flashback with Luther before he's arrested to see him more as before prison Luther. Because as of right now, he doesn't exactly feel like Lex Luther to me. It's kind of like there's that, it's a, like, you know, a little too off at the moment. But if you give me a little like flashback and then I kind of see how he got here. Then I'll be like, okay, it'll kind of mold a little bit better in my brain. Yeah. He kind of felt like, um, uh, what was it? White tiger or white dragon from, uh, from peacemaker, uh, peacemaker's dad. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in that sort of like, well, he's <laughs> like the, the, this like prison kind like th there's like a thuggish component to him that I, I found mm -hmm. interesting. You know, I, I Do is it, Again, like, would this be how I do Luther always? No, but I, no. I was definitely intrigued by this sort of, like, the stance of him where he is very hard uh, in a way that, like, we often don't see with Lex Luthor. And that's fine. Like, I'm, I'm, got, I'm cool with him being that way now, but show me him in before just so I can kind of understand his journey more. And I think we will see that with, like, he's looking for his daughter. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Um, much like they've done really good in the past few seasons of showing us kind of stuff in the past with Bruno and then showing us stuff in the past with uh, Lucy and Lois's relationship in season two and things. 
So I, I look forward to that in season four. Now, did you watch Titans this season? I did. I haven't gotten into Titans. It's been on. It's always been on my like list to check out, but it's just just if you get a chance. Okay, I'm gonna say this. Just go into season two, find the Superboy episode, watch it. Because it is almost a complete standalone episode. And because I love the Superboy on Titans. they I think he was underused, but I loved him. And the reason why is they introduced in the last season of Titans, Lex Luthor. And he's um, played by the great Titus Welliver. So it's kind of interesting. We got two Lex Luthers this year. In a similar style, but yet different. I'll just say that they both had beards, which was like long beards. And I don't, I don't like this trend of Luther with a beard. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, I want to stop it. Um, yeah, it, it makes me think of um, the Alan Moore Supreme run, where they had the Golden Age version of their Lex Luthor analog, and he had a beard, and then all the other ones had uh, a full head of hair uh, and no beard. Um, yeah just that that kind of style again i don't really mind it here like i thought it was fine for this like i'm just out of prison i've got tattoos i've like i had beaten up so many people and threatened so many people that i became king of the prison i was in and was able to like expand my criminal empire while in jail kind of lex Luthor. Mm -hmm. i kind of wish he didn't have it when he went in yeah yeah it was weird that he had like full head of hair and the beard and he just shaved the head like it would have been interesting if he if that had been flipped over over time yeah, it would be. Yeah, exactly. I w- that, that makes sense. So, but all right. So that's Case's quick thoughts here. Now we're going to move into, like we talked about, the Ruby Spears series. We're going to start um, with episode four. That's where we are in our discussion. The one we really want to talk about is five, but we can't skip four to get to five. So we got to do four. And my, uh, my summary is Cybron, a human machine hybrid, comes to the future to cyberize earth in the episode cybron strikes All yeah right. the one that fe- clearly feels like it should have been a bizarro episode but for it had to be legally distinct for reasons uh it also felt like he was a villain from he-man that's really what i put in my notes i was like this feels like a he-man like he reminds me of like the he-man toys yeah i i, I think that's gonna just be an issue with this particular series um it's so a product of its time and part of that is that it has the art style and voice cast of all the cartoons from the 80s. Um, so it's not weird that the design work on the characters, like when it's like, even if it's supposed to be Brainiac, but like, you know, is again, legally mm-hmm. distinct from Brainiac, like the, 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 the new design that they go for is going to feel very much like all of those kind of like 80s, like action figure things. <laughs> mm hmm. I just, I have in my notes, what made me so happy was Cybron here is voiced by Frank Welker. Um, Of course, Frank Welker is amazing. Um, When I hear Frank Welker, I immediately think of Scooby-Doo, because we are a big Scooby-Doo family. He voiced Fred, for anyone who didn't know that. And when I say he voiced Fred, I mean, he is Fred. (laughs) Unless it's a pup named Scooby-Doo, if it's Scooby-Doo and animated, it's Frank Welker. Since the beginning, the dawn of time. Um, and then he, of course he did Megatron and pretty sure he did Cobra Commander. He's, uh, like Frank Welker has a, a ridiculous filmography when you, oh, yeah. when you look it up and it's still working today. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. He's still working. He, he currently does the voice of both Scooby and Fred on Scooby-Doo shows. So it's, uh, <laughs> the man is very talented, but I was trying to think he, of just like his eighties. I think he did Soundwave and Shockwave both from Transformers. And that's kind of where the Cybron kind of feels like. But this episode was just weird because what's funny about episode four is I'm um, pulling up my notes here. He's just making these. Um, he's in a cube, like just traveling around. He's from the future and he makes Jimmy look like a Clipso. That's what I said <laughs> because I was because like he like took over his face. But yeah. Uh, and I also had a laugh because Jimmy says Jeepers. Like Jeepers. I'm like, yep, Jimmy, you're not in Scooby-Doo, yeah, bro. J- <laughs> J- Jimmy's a hard one to like fit right. Like it, you either go too soft or too hard with him. Like his 90s phase of being like super into Metallica was 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 too much the other direction. Um uh, 
like finding the right balance of corny and uh and like a cool kid is uh, is a tough line so here's my question to you then because we've been talking about different things where do you see the character because i believe that superman legacy we're going to get all the daily planet characters i really feel that like that's something in james gunn's uh wheelhouse of creating you know casts of characters groups so i'm pretty sure we're going to get jimmy perry lombard you know cat grant what do you think is the the way jimmy olsen should be like if clark let's say clark is 30 how old should jimmy be uh, so the the tough part there is that like if we're talking about like old school superman stuff like jimmy should be a teenager but that's in a world where like teenagers were like taking work in a lot more serious ways because it was like world war two era and a lot of people were overseas and uh, you know, it was just a very different world uh, that we're coming yeah. from um, in terms of like modern stuff. I think like an intern really is sort of where he should be coming in from and then like working mm -hmm. to become a photographer over the course of whatever run we're talking about. I agree. So like in college or just out of college kind of age. See, I, I put if Superman is 30, I said eight years is the, is the biggest gap I want between them. Okay. So I feel like if he's any, if he's 10 years or younger, it starts to feel like he's Superman's son. <laughs> you know, it's not his pal, Jimmy Olsen. You know, it's, it's, it, it feels a little too much, you know, there's that, there's too much of a distance in there. Now, if there was 30 and 40, yeah. But like a 20 year old hanging out with like a 30 year old, I can see it, you know? But I don't know. I said eight year difference. Yeah, I, I think if he had, if he was like fully a teenager, it's too much in the modern era of the character. Because like the son relationship used to be a thing in like the Silver Age kind of dynamic, and like you, you know, cert, certain versions can can roll with it. But I think it would feel weird in a modern setting. Um, I, I I think you could probably get away with twenty or twenty one. Um, you know, as long as it's like he's a college student who is, you know, an intern at the, the planet and doing, you know, all the stuff that he's trying to do. And like Clark is like the one person at the planet who like even calls him by his first name or anything like that. Like the only person yeah. who like actually is nice to him, because I remember those experiences of like my like my first jobs out of, out of school or my like the, the couple internships I did while I, while I was in college or, or stuff like that, where like I do remember those relationships with people who were those sort of older mentors at that time. I mm -hmm. probably agree with you that like 22, 23, where he's out of school, it makes it a little bit more natural because he's not going to be divided as much. Like if Jimmy's going to be main cast and not like also like taking classes somewhere or, you know, like disappearing for like things that are totally unrelated to the Daily mm -hmm. Planet drama, he really needs to be working full time there and probably working his ass off to try to like pay rent or, you know, what, whatever like secret fortune his family might have. But like he should be like living that sort of like starving artist, like I want to be a photographer kind of like vibe uh, for a character. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. He just graduated college, first job. He's a, he's a gr intern coming up, you know. I think that's the perfect place for Jimmy um, to be. Yeah. So since we were, you know, talking about Jimmy here, I, I just, because I think it, it needs to be where he, he clicks with Clark and Lois. There's a vibe to him that they kind of both latch onto. So that you get that really great dynamic. But if he's too young, it gets awkward. You know, if he's too old, it's like he's their peer more than like a protege yeah. type thing. So like Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, like I, as much as I like the uh, the 90s uh, Superman the animated series, um, like Jimmy was a little too old in that setting for my taste. Like he was, he was already working at the planet and like fairly experienced by the time Clark starts. Um, and I, I think they threaded the needle pretty well, but like they were coming at it a little, it, it could have, it could have gone wrong. Like sometimes he's been too old. And it, and like you said, it's like, well, is Obi-Wan really like an apprentice kind of vibe? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if the, it, depending on the casting and how they make the characters look and like, you really do need to have that kind of mentor mentee relationship really for both Clark and Superman. And they should be teaching him different things, even though it's secretly the same person. I agree. Now, finishing up episode four of the Ruby Spears here, um, it's called the first day of school. And this is where a young school age Clark Kent meets Lana Lang. Now, Case, 
what did you notice about Lana Lang in this episode? Uh, hang on, sorry. I actually didn't rewatch this episode because I was just doing Big Scoop. Um, That's so. fine. She's born. Oh, okay. I, I, could, yeah, I couldn't it, remember it, specifically. It, <laughs> so. I, was, I was like, dang it, show! Like, I have a huge thing about, like, character's hair. Like, I know it sounds horrible, but um, I just, I feel like, you know, in comics, it was such a big deal because you only had so many right. colors. And to identify certain characters, like, you know, Lois Lane has black hair. Lana Lang has red hair. And then since the Superboy TV series, we have not had a redheaded Lana Lang. Yeah, it, it, there's this element of redheads in comics. L like you said, there, there's such a restricted limit in terms of like how you identify people. Like the art style, especially because of the way it's printed, usually wasn't very high detail. And so like while you might have great pencilers doing stuff who could do much more detailed work, spitting out a monthly book, especially on the, these this like cruder printing style, like how much facial detail are you really going to get? Um, and so hair color oftentimes was the big way you could really identify a character. Um, and redheads were usually, here's the more exotic one in the very whitewashed period of like, you know, yeah. a lot of the history of American comics, um, which creates this sort of weird scenario of like, oftentimes the redhead is the one that gets turned into some other, like a different ethnic group. So for the purpose yep. of having like more diversity, and it's like, it's weird that the character who is already kind of the pseudo diversity and, I, I realize that there's some big air quotes around that one. <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah. You can't see us, but yeah. yeah. We both it, it has been a very interesting concept. Yeah. Uh but I but mean, you see it all over the place. And like I'm generally okay with Lana being like changed in some way, mostly though so that she stands out from Lois in a particular way. Because she's always supposed to contrast Lois distinctly. Um it is weird that it's always Lana and not like another character, you know, like that mm -hmm. that's the part that's kind of strange. It's the, you know, it's the same thing that where it's like, it's kind of weird that like all the lightning characters eventually become black. And it like, again, it's not like by itself, it wouldn't be the issue. It's weird that it always just, it happens so much. Um, like when the Legion of superheroes reboot with Bendis, it's like, Oh, why did lightning lad? <laughs> like, couldn't it have been anyone yeah. else? Because like, it's, it's that trope. Uh, <laughs> and he's the redhead who also, become, you know, like I mean, there, there look, are people online I mean, who are like crazy about this stuff. Like they'll be like, Oh, all the ginger characters are going away. And like that, that line is just like insane and stupid. And most of the people are coming at it from a bad faith perspective, but it is interesting that like, that is still where like, again, like I said, it was like the pseudo diversity when it's an all white cast, like the redheads, the weird one, um, you know, it's the redheads, redhead stepchild kind of situation. Uh, and yeah. then now it's like, Okay, well, it's still our diversity, and it's like, well, but couldn't you just have more diversity? Couldn't anyone else be? Yeah, <laughs> something. I mean, you know, just just to give people an idea, we're talking about the West family on Superman or on the Flash, where redheads that are now all African American, MJ, the way they did MJ with current Spider Man, uh, of course, the aerial controversy that was blown out of proportion right. by people. Um, Josie and the Pussycats. Yes. And let's see with a uh, Riverdale I mean, specifically. Um, yes. Yeah. I yeah. knew what you, I knew what you meant with Riverdale. Um, let's see. Um, it's on tip my mind. We just, uh, Jimmy Olsen. Yeah. Yeah. Duh. Yeah, exactly. And Jimmy on Supergirl. Supergirl. And I know there's a couple more I'm not thinking of, but it's just a weird conundrum. And like, for me, like if I was trying to change Lombard would be a, an easy one. Cat Grant. Um, you know, they, they made what is the animated death of Superman movie made Cat Grant African-American. Um, but Lombard would be one that you could change. But it's just funny. It's yeah. The again, case. in a vacuum, this is fine. Most of the people complaining about it is bad faith. It is, but it is weird and it is okay to acknowledge that it is a weird coincidence that happens every single time. Uh, and it just, it's a little strange. And like here it's, it's a different thing. It's just blonde because their color limits were whatever. Uh, but <laughs> Uh, but it, but it is a, a curious thing, you know, like Emmanuel Chiriki in Superman and Lois, amazing casting for the purpose of this type of Lana Lang that we're getting, yes. but you know, it's, it is different. <laughs> yeah. You could, do, you know, it's like, she feels like a spiritual successor to Lana from. Oh Smallville, yeah, absolutely. Who, you know, who was brunette and everything. So it's weird. Even the young girl, Lana, and then they're in Man of Steel is brunette and then supposedly lana is supposed to be at the funeral scene but i it's very hard to pick right. her out but she's there um so yeah redhead lana we miss you yeah <laughs>
Yeah. All right. But that said, I mean, like, I do, I just, I, I don't necessarily have like a ton to say about either the first day of school or overnight with the scouts, aside from I love the young Clark stuff in this series. I think it's really solid, like, like low stakes, but at the same time, just kind of like fun adventures of the character. I like the convention of it being like the family album. You know, it's written by Marv Wolfman. Uh, so mm -hmm. we're dealing with like, uh, you know, a pretty loving take on the character. And it does a really good job of setting up of like in the absence of Superboy as part of his canon, which was such a new thing yep. when the show came out. Like this is right in the wake of the Man of Steel relaunch, like to bring yep. in those elements. And, th and one of the, those other elements is a big part of the big scoop. The next episode. Like, it's cool that we're trying to incorporate the new comic stuff and have it still feel appropriate to all the stuff that you just know about Superman. Like, like none of this is would be wrong for someone who thinks of Superman as having been Superboy. But it's, like, nice mm -hmm. that it's like, yeah, no, Clark, he, like, he was doing, like, scouting stuff. Or he, like, had, you know, had superpowers for, like, you know, shenanigans, kind of the way that, like, Superboy was kind of originally intended to be a prankster before he just became Superman but young. Yep. Oh, no, I, I think it's great because it does just like you said, it is post crisis. It provides some sort of like backstory and it's kind of like a backup. If you're looking at it as like a comic book, this is your little backup chapter, you know, that eventually is collected in a story. So doing these little family item things is just kind of neat to kind of see where he came from. How instead of, you know, having the Kent in modern time, which we'll talk about in a second, um, I, I enjoy them because it's kind of. You know, cutesy, funny. Um, in the earlier episode when he gets adopted, I had to laugh because, you know, he's got his full flight powers and baby, like infant baby Clark flies to the Kents and they find him and <laughs> laying with him in bed. I was like, hmm, I'm not sure if that would really work like that, but okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's such a classic thing of like what the pop culture, you know, like the series in general, like is such a, here's an amalgam of everything people know about pop culture Superman. Here is the Donner movies. And then here is mm -hmm. the modern Man of Steel stuff. And it's all, it's jumbled, modern being the 1980s Man of Steel stuff, uh, all being like jumbled together into something that has to appeal to a wide audience. Um, and so like the the shot from like the Donner movie of like baby Clark picking up the car is so well known. And like, there's all these like incidents of super baby and stuff from the silver age that people just kind of remember. Um, and while Man of Steel had sort of established that, or pardon me, the Man of Steel had established that like Clark yeah. didn't have his powers at first and that they grew up, grew, like they grew in time. Like they do establish by the time he's like six, he's invulnerable enough to get stomp, like trampled by a cow and not die. Um, so it's like early enough where, you know, if you're not really thinking about it too much, you're like, oh, yeah, he probably had all of his powers by, you know, by the time he was like kind of a kid. Right. Maybe maybe a baby. I don't, I don't know. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I like it. I yeah. roll with it. Works for me. Yeah. I mean, these wouldn't work in the canon of the comics of the time, but they work fairly well for being like kind of just a. Like, oh, yeah, that's a fun Superman growing up kind of story that, again, it's low stakes, but usually they're like pretty like they're pretty amusing for how short they are. Like they're, they're like little shorts that are like kind of just like nice snippets of like Superman growing up. And I think that they are, they are the strongest part of the, of the series in terms of the overall package it's presenting. Like, I think there are some very solid, like we, we were saying the show is very much a product of its time. Like the voice cast is very much like everyone you'd kind of expect. Like if you've watched GI Joe and He-Man and turtles and any, you know, any other thing from the, the, you know, mid to late eighties. Um, you've heard all of these actors before they've been in a billion things. Um, yeah. but in, in this scenario, it's like, well, the, the Superman stuff is perfectly fine. Superman fair, but it's, it's not anything that's going to like blow you away. If you've grown, if you've grown up on like Hanna Barbera superhero knockoff stuff. Um, it, but like adding this extra element of him growing up kind of adds to the mythology of the character. And I think that that creates, a, like you said, a stronger overall package that they're presenting of like, yeah, if you, if you like the movies and like, we know we're trying to appeal to the movies, the opening credits are the Superman theme song from the movies, just, you know, slightly modified. And like the first scene of Superman and Lois in the first episode is them doing the flight scene from, from the first movie. Like if you mm -hmm. like all the movie stuff, um, but you want to just have a better feel for the character. These are really nice, like snippets of the character to, to give you that like additional context. Totally. I could say it better. Like, it's just, it's nice and refreshing. And, you know, I've been watching these with my kids. Um, so this kind of, they think it's kind of funny and just the little things. Cause 
you know, my kids are six and eight. So as Clark's kind of growing up, you know, they're like, oh, now, he, now he's like my age. I'm like, yeah, he's, he's your age here, Sayla. You know, in the first day of school, I guess she'll be starting first grade. So, you know, it was kind of like her relating to it. And then the camping one, I'm like, yeah, this is like your age, Solomon. So make yeah. it fun. Now to the one that Case was eager to talk about, the big scoop. <laughs> um, it has a 6.5 on IMDb. <laughs> And it is, says Luther steals a prophetic machine and discovers Superman's true identity in the big scoop. I'll let you take it away here and talk first. All right. So I, when I was trying to pick episodes, I was trying to pick one that was like probably not a lot of people are like fighting over, but it would still like kind of cover the things I wanted to discuss. Um, and I, I will be frank. The bigger reason I picked the episode was the overnight with the scouts part. Not that I have a lot to say about it. It's just like a good example of like, yeah, no Superman doing Superman stuff, but like just as a kid, like he's, doing yeah. kid stuff and his superpowers are letting him like get away with some stuff a little bit better but the the the, the central threat like not threat but the central like challenge of the sequence is made easier by super by yeah by superpowers but not negated by superpowers uh that being that his friends are all scared of a boogeyman and he's also kind of scared of a boogeyman um it, and it ends up with him being like a friend to animals and that that's fun there so that that's the big reason that i was like, yeah, let, let's talk about it. But also, we get a Lex Luthor episode, and he appears a lot in this series. Uh, and it's an interesting time for them to tackle how they want to depict Lex Luthor, because this is the rise of the businessman Lex, and the like, oh, I'm like, I'm like Teflon, you can't pen anything on me kind of character um, that, you know, is so influential to the modern interpretation of the character, but was very new at the point when this came out. Uh and the idea of him stealing like a, just like a, a scientific device that lets him see an hour into the future is like that, that's normal enough like TV show fare that 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 part's fine but it's like cute that it's in Smallville and that we get the Kents in there and that we get the like Jonathan Kent as uh, disguising himself as Superman and so he gets to play a part in a Superman adventure and the, like those are moments and while it's <laughs> <laughs> like a weird it's weird to be like oh yeah he's able to perfectly emulate clark it's like well yeah i mean it depends on which jonathan frankly like smallville jonathan <laughs> sure man of steel kevin costner jonathan probably could pull it off in terms of just like height build and like you know he's got the man you know the mission impossible mask that he puts on um yep. as opposed to a superman robot which would be like the classic situation if it was like an you know or Marshall or, Man yeah, or, yeah exactly. Thing. If it was five years earlier, it'd be a, a Superman robot or some other kind of like zany Superman thing. If it was five years later, they would find a way to tie it into the bigger DC lore because they were trying to make the the shared universe, you know, more shared between them all. Uh, or it'd be like Matrix Supergirl. <laughs> uh, yeah. If this was like a, if this show ran for like two more seasons and they were allowed to use that, I, I could actually see that happening. Um, but it, it it was nice to be like, oh, yeah, well, Jonathan being alive and knowing all the things about Clark is a useful tool. Um, it's the kind of story that would have happened with Superboy back in the day. Um, be, and I, I argue that the decision to keep the Kents alive in the post-crisis continuity means that for at least a period of time, the adventures of Superman as he's existing as, in, as like a new superhero are kind of more reminiscent of the Silver Age material than the later stuff, just by virtue of that like parental connection. Um, which is why I think it's okay for him to start with them alive and then have, you know, Jonathan die a little bit later into his career. And then like, you know, like Superman and Lois opening with like, um, with Martha dying. I think that's like a good mm -hmm. progression right there. Um, so it, it was cool here in this moment. Like there's, there's certainly storytelling potential to having Jonathan Kent and, Mar and Martha, but Jonathan Kent alive uh, that a lot of media kind of just overlooks because it became the default to say like, Oh, well he died of a heart attack. And I get, it's a very poignant kind of thing that Superman couldn't have stopped that. Um, you know, the, the all-star Superman up, or, uh, issue is so touching when it happens or yeah. I mean, even in the Donner movie, when it happens, it, it means so much where it's like, yeah, no Superman can't do everything. Like he can't stop death. He can't work his way around all the, all these things that humans have in front of them. He just can do a lot of stuff more easily, or he can be, you know, a figure of collective ac action as one person. Um, you know, he can, he can move mountains the way that like a million men could um, like those kind of things. But again, like I said, here is a, it, here is a prime example where Jonathan being alive allows for storytelling possibilities that would not have existed otherwise. I like it because 
not to go too deep on anything, but the fact that I don't think Superman is not motivated by Jonathan's death to be Superman. Like he just yeah. is. And that's a big deal with him. Just he does it because it's something he can do. And I feel like sometimes they've made the death of Jonathan, like his point of like, like in Superman, the movie, like this is my point to go on my journey, my hero's journey. Um, I don't think he has to have that. I think having his father around is a big deal, even for the entire DC universe as a whole, because uh, more recently in comics in Tom Taylor's run, there was a great um, part where Jonathan Kent's talking to Batman and you find out that John Jonathan has talked to Alfred every day. Yeah that Alfred and Jonathan had maintained a friendship and, you know, Jonathan and Martha become like this parental figures to anyone in the DC universe. So I, I feel like having Jonathan die when he's full on Superman later in life is more impactful. Cause like it goes back to, I have all these powers and I can't stop it um, compared to he died when I was young and then I became Superman. Right. I, yeah, totally agree. Uh, so in, in the context of this episode, I, I had to think, okay, I haven't, I've like, I've only seen like, you've only been like six, five, six episodes, like, right? And I'm like, I haven't seen a Fortress of Solitude yet, have I? No, I don't think so. Does he have super bots? Like, I'm, I'm going through this because they're not really, you know, connected stories, um, serialized storytelling. So I'm like, what is this Superman when Jonathan shows up? I'm like, is this a bot? Right. That was my first thought. <laughs> and then uh, when the episode started and they were back in Smallville, at this laboratory and I'm like, are the parents still alive? I'm like, cause all we get is the flashback episode. Yeah. I think know? this was the episode that confirmed that one. Um, yeah. Cause literally in my notes, it says, is Jonathan and Martha alive? And then the next part they're back, they're on the Kent farm. I'm like, okay. Well, even you. before that, the, uh, the doctor knows the Kents and asks how they're doing. And Clark immediately, like very quickly in the episode, it's like, Oh, they're doing great. They say hi. Yes. Um, you're right. So right, I, right. I, and I like that element. Um, we didn't, I didn't actually give like a full synopsis of this for anyone who yeah. hasn't been following the series. Uh, this, this episode, the, the a plot is specifically, there is a device that, uh, someone de develops that allows you to see an hour into the future. Luther steals it. And, the the big scoop that is the title of this because at first you think it's going to be about the machine itself because Lois calls it a huge scoop um, is that it turns out that uh, Luther is able to see that Clark Kent is Superman and so from this point on Luther is using this device to see an hour into the future to plan around Superman's presence but also he's trying to do this cat and mouse game to force Superman to reveal his identity to the world um, and specifically in a way that the, the news network that Superman or that um, pardon me, the news network that Lex Luthor owns will get the break on it. Like we'll get the scoop on it and get, a, you know, huge ratings, um, which I found interesting that the host of his like news program felt like kind of the, um, uh, the, the, the 24 hour news cycle type uh, pundits mm -hmm. that we see today. Yep. Commentary commentators compared to like news. Yeah. He was much more of a showman instead of like an actual like reporter, like the way that we see with like Clark and Lois. Um, so I thought that was like kind of a, an interesting, con like contrasting point right there uh, and very prescient to the world that we would be living in, you know, just 10 years later uh, from that, mm -hmm. let alone like now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, exactly. He's that, he's that sleazy late night kind of person. And yeah. And it's, it's interesting just how this episode plays out with the, you know, the Kents being involved and then Clark getting cornered by Luther and Luther basically saying, you know, you're Superman and Clark's like, Oh, I don't feel well. I've been sick. And Luther has his kryptonite ring out and they're trying to play it off that Clark isn't uh well. And then um, <clears throat> when Clark tries to go and save his parents, he runs out and gets a hold of the helicopter, then falls between in the clouds. Then all of a sudden Superman you yeah. know, comes flying through I'm like, well played Clark. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, it was interesting. Uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned the, the kryptonite ring. Um, Luther uses it to try to suss out that, that Clark Kent is Superman. Um, and, and I enjoy it because it made me, the first time it like shows up in the show, it made me realize that the Lex Luthor toys that I remember from being a kid were tied to the show specifically because they're like, Luthor's got a kryptonite ring kind of thing. Uh, and that's also like an invention of the like man of steel era, like John Byrne era of the character. Um, and it, it's something I realized I'd always just sort of associated with the character 
because that was specifically the window of when I was becoming aware of Superman properties. Um, and it that it's so interesting that they already like codified some of that into this like adaptation. What's so funny is you say that like in my mind, like when I would watch Superman the movie, I'd always be really upset with Gene Hackman's Lex Luthor. I was always mad. It's like this isn't Lex Luthor. Where's Lex Corp? Luther Corp? You know, like where's the business? And then it it dawned on me, you know, years later, that when I looked at it in the time frame, that oh, that didn't come until the eighties. This movie was made in 78. Like, oh, wait. Okay. This makes sense now. <laughs> Why Lex Luthor? You know, because I was so used to this one version and I wasn't, you know, my child brain wasn't syncing up. Okay. When did he become a, you know, businessman? All right. This was made before that. So this is really the first media version of the new found yeah. Lex. And that's what I think is so weird about this show is it just not really having that prominent place in or the fact that this, you know, did not last. No, it, it, it's, it's weird because it's also it's not bad. Like it's it's not the greatest thing ever, but it's it's not bad. The animation quality is great. The the voice acting, it's all it's all perfect for 1988. Like, it, like I said, it's jarring yeah. because every voice actor on this has been in a million things at this exact window of time. Uh, so everyone is like, no, I, I know that voice. I know that voice. Like, you, you might not know all their names as actors, but you're like, no, I definitely recognize them from, you know, a thing. Uh, like I said, if you were a fan of G.I. Joe, you definitely know a few of these voices. Um, but it's it's just such a <laughs> like the fact that it didn't get another season is just such this weird, like, yeah, this was like this blip. And then a couple of years later, we got the animated series, which is such a strong piece that feels iterative of the same, because it's drawing from the same era of comics. Um, it feels iterative of this. Like this feels like the prototype for the Dini verse, mm -hmm. like Superman show. Yeah. And it's, it's so weird because I watch this and it feels of its time. I watch Superman the Animated Series. Any of that Bruce Timm stuff, honestly. And it feels timeless. Yeah. The animation, because I say that because, you know, my kids walk in when I'm watching this and they'll watch it sometimes. But we can watch an episode of Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series. We were actually, um, the kids and I, yesterday for some reason, they wanted to play Arkham City. They, they got out of the disc, the games, and like, let's play this. Like I came home and they were like, they were starting to play it. So me and the kids spent like three hours taking turns, just all of us working together, playing Arkham city. And in Arkham city, like we changed the costume to Batman beyond and they were talking about it. So tonight as we were having dinner, we watched the pilot for Batman beyond and they were so into it. And I'm like, that was 1999, you know, it's over 20 years ago, but it still holds up and it's still engrossing children. And I think that's a testament to that animation time. Because I feel like a lot of stuff that we're getting now won't hold to that timelessness that'll translate to, like, my grandchildren. God, that's weird to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that the, the stylized look that they adopted goes a long way for that. The decision to have Batman be particularly a like a temporal like the the this you know the old timey kind of elements but also like modern computers and uh like screens that just don't look right like there's a lot of like art deco and mm -hmm. mid-century modern elements that are incorporated into superman the animated series even if it's less so than the batman animated series um and i think those all go a long way for it not being jarring how like how specific a point that it was created at was like the worst you could say yes. is that you, you know there's no smartphones yeah, I mean, honestly, yes. So here's another question for you as we get into this. How excited are you for My Adventures with Superman? Oh, that looks really cool. I, I can't wait to watch it. The best thing about it is my friend Luke, the geek of steel, uh, Mr. Luke Bugged, he was able to watch the, a couple episodes early to do a review. Um, and I messaged him when he said he posted him. I asked him one thing. I said, is this something I can watch with my kids? Because that's the thing that's kind of bugged me about it being classified under adult swim. And his response was, yes, absolutely. Watch it with your kids. Watch it. It's great family fun. And that made me so happy because I had seen an article that said it was supposed to be like, you know, 
for family or whatever. And I'm like, why is it a midnight on adult swim, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? Um, so like, it just made me happy. So I'm really looking forward to next week. Um, when it premieres to be able to watch it with my kids. Yeah. And hopefully that has like a same kind of timeless kind of component, you know, like the, the thing is animation is, is hard. Like it's, and, and figuring out how to do it weekly in a way that is visually appealing uh, it is difficult. And so like we, we see learning curves as people come up with new tricks to, to get those kind of production cycles going, like the Hanna-Barbera stuff of the sixties and seventies, like a lot of that, when you look back on it, like the still frames look okay, but, but you know, the animation itself is terrible yeah. because they're doing so many tricks in order to be able to like perpetuate you know, to get an episode out on the timetable that they have on the budget that they have. Um, And, you know, you look at this season and this season of a show, like the animation is great because they put a bunch of money into it. Um, But that, that wasn't going to last. They don't have like, they're overcoming issues because they just had a good budget. That wouldn't be a way to like really work around it. Like like they're not doing any sort of tricks to really sort of make up for it. Um, and and you see eras where the the technology opens up new possibilities. They haven't figured out how to make it look good, like all the CGI stuff of mm-hmm. the late '90s going into the early 2000s. Um, even some of the cell shaded stuff now, we're still kind of like figuring out how to make it look like not you know jarring. Um, mm. The when you figure out your tricks, like when you figure out the ways for it to be smooth and to have you know a good budget behind it and to not be cutting corners. Um, but as you learn all these new stuff or like all these new things, it becomes more and more likely to hold up over time. Um, and so I'm really hoping that the new show is, is doing all the stuff that like things like invincible are, are pulling off um, in terms of yes. just having this, like, you know, a, a clean style that we're like, there, there's animation issues in, in all of these works. Like if you really go back and look at the, the Superman, the animated series, there's plenty of times where he's flying and it's just kind of a still, <laughs> like cell of Superman moving across. Um, but yeah. usually they're like, okay, but we figured out how to make the cape move. And that's like the big seller in terms of him flying, you know, uh, yep. invincible has plenty of spots where like there's animation issues. You can tell when like they're putting more money into a scene versus less. Um, but as, as we go, the, the goal is that the easy tricks become easier to put in there to like really sell you on it. Um, and to keep making it so that with less and less effort, it can still look, good in a way that isn't going to bother you down the road. You're absolutely correct. And it's a bummer that this show didn't quite nail it here. So, uh, right. And I mean, you talked about Hannah Barbera, like Ruby Spears used to work for Hannah Barbera. They, they created Scooby-Doo, you know, and then went off and did their own company. And it's right at that time where they were kind of coming up as competitors for, um, filmation and Hanna Barbera and then eventually Ruby Spears kind of went away. I don't know exactly when they you know turned it in or whatever and I wonder if that has something to do with why this show never got attention that it needed or whatever, you know, cuz I can't think of a whole lot of things that were produced by Ruby Spears. Um I mean they ran into the 90s like they did I mean ones that stand out for me like looking at so sky surfer i remember which was their last like big show that they did um they did mega man uh the like the super fighting robot one from the 90s um okay. they did cowboys of moo mesa uh yeah i remember yeah, that dink the little dinosaur was about the same time they were doing this which actually probably is why i'm like oh all the names or all the voices sound really familiar <laughs> because they're, they're a lot of the cartoons they were doing at this time i distinctly remember um I, I think it was a license issue in terms of getting it from Warner Brothers. Like they got greenlit for this, but it didn't like really sell enough. You know, it didn't really move the needle enough uh, for Warner Brothers. Um, and so they kind of like pulled back on that production. Also, let, let, we got to remember Superman four was not the big seller. So I, I could imagine everyone being like, we kind of need to not be invested so much in this property right now. We need to take a step back. Looks like Batman's going to be more popular soon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm just looking. They did the Plastic Man comedy show. Um, they ended in 96. Thundar the Barbarian. Ah, oh, they... Yeah, I mean, they have an impressive they, roster. Honestly... And the animation for a lot of these shows looked really good for the quality of the show. Like, Sky Surfer Strike Force was not a good show. But it looked incredible. 
I'm just looking at they did a lot of co-productions with other yeah. companies. Like the, like the Alvin and the Chipmunks cartoon from 83 to 83. Yeah, they had the Rambo TV show. Uh, Centurions. Yeah. Like, that's, you know, again, talk about a show that yep. looked great. So it's just Chuck Norris Karate Commandos. Police Academy, the series. They did it right before Superman. And like you said, Dink the Dinosaurs. Then, yeah. Cowboys of Moo Mesa. I feel like I was the only person for the longest time who ever knew that show existed. <laughs> you're you're in good company. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because my brother and I had uh, Colorado Kid and Marshall Moo Montana figures. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we used to, I love watching all of those cartoons. But, oh, but yeah, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I'm just looking at their roster here. It's just neat, you know, like, I feel like I have a whole speech I could give you about how I feel like um, Cartoon Network is the reason why cartoons suck and how we don't have Toys R Us anymore. So I'll give you a whole speech about that, but I won't take up any more time. So Case, let everybody know, again, where they can find you as we wrap up here. Yeah, uh, so if you are interested in Superman-type material, which I'm assuming you would be if you're listening to the show uh i am the co-host of men of steel which is a podcast on the certain point of view podcast network um so we talk about superman and superman adjacent material and by that i mean stuff like invincible or the boys or you know like things where it's like we're, t we're talking about the same power fantasy but interpreted through a different lens um but we do a lot of superman coverage we just finished a lot of material about the death and return of superman we looked at all the different adaptations we went through all the the comics from the original time period of that uh and then we actually looked at the uh superman 154 the the gold or pardon me, the silver age story that jerry siegel wrote um <clears throat> about superman dying as an imaginary story uh and then we looked at a play that I wrote that was based on that issue uh, that I produced back when I did theater in New York. Um, so th th that that's all the Superman stuff. Uh, I have a YouTube series that's a sister project to that um, called Superman Analogs that's on the certain POV media YouTube channel uh, where I do like roughly like three to five minute kind of like here's an explainer of all the big important points about a character who's like kind of based on Superman. Uh, so at the time of this recording, the most recent episode was on um, the Plutonian from Irredeemable. So that kind of vibe of a, of a character if in terms of like the series uh, i did i did a big run of all the different characters named superwoman fairly recently um but i've been doing this now for about 120 episodes so there there's a decent backlog if you're if you want to check those out and like i said they're pretty short so please do it's uh it's a really fun project um and then if you are interested in my takes on movie stuff i also am the host of another pass which is a movie podcast where we do um Film analysis is probably the easiest way to say it. It's like a script doctor type show where we look at movies that are fascinating but flawed and then speculate on mm. what could have been done at the time of production to fix it. Um, and then every five episodes, we look at a movie that had big production issues and overcame them through creativity as kind of a proof of concept. So, for example, our most recent fifth episode was Total Recall, which was just an absolute nightmare in terms of actually getting the movie greenlit and then... Arnold Schwarzenegger and Paul Verhoeven had entirely different visions of what the movie was. Um, and so you can see how like scenes are laid out and how everything is done with these two very different kind of like, uh, like auteur voices going into it. So really interesting productions there. Um, I, I highly recommend check out our Predator episode where we just laugh at just the the terrible conditions of filming that and just the amount of diarrhea <laughs> that was on set. Um, but we also do really fun discussions of like crazy movies that, uh, you know, really should have been better. Like we we recently did The Island of Dr. Moreau, which, man, talk about a movie that like you you would think could have been just so much stronger and just 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 wasn't. Uh <laughs> Like from a lot of poor planning and a lot of people who just didn't know what they were doing. So uh, fun conversations. Uh, we, we always bring on guests and we try to like have cool people uh, come on for, for those chats. Um, all that can be found on like all your basic podcast stuff uh, or go to certain POV.com uh, and yeah, check out all my stuff. All right. Well, thank you for being here. We yeah, appreciate thank, it. thank you for having me back check on out his podcast anytime. Yeah. Just, it sucks that we had all the, you know, issues getting started with um, technical problems. Yeah, so. we, we both were having technical issues, and uh, I apologize for whatever this is going to do to you in the edit. But uh, yeah, it, it was a fun conversation. I'm sorry it was uh, a little disrupted. Yeah, I have been worse. So remember, good listeners. Look up in the sky. 
We just want to say, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please check out other podcasts on the Press Play Podcast Network. One dollar a month, you'll get extra special content that you don't get on the main show, like movie commentaries and whatever else comes out of our mouths. So check it out, patreon.com slash krypton. We're going to press pause and hear a few words from our other podcasts on Press Play Podcast Network. Hello, Brooks here with the Books with Brooks monthly book club podcast. Here's how Books with Brooks works. We read one book a month and then we talk about it. Classics like Stephen King's The Shining, debut novels like We Are the Brennans by Tracy Lang, and tons of other compelling, life-changing stories, one book and one month at a time. So come read along with us and then listen in. Before we start this episode of Krypton Report, I want to take a moment and just give a shout out here to our Patreon. I know what you're thinking. Gosh, everyone's asking for money, and I get it. But our Patreon is only a dollar. One dollar a month that helps us keep the podcast going. And what we do is we try to find interesting shows and topics and whatever we want to talk about. We've done, as of this little thing, our last recordings were on the Scream series. Brian and Tyler, that's me, do our own show where we record in the car, and it's kind of funny. And we talk about pop culture or whatever is going on. We also have the Supernatural podcast we've been reworking. It's taken some time just because of life. But we do movie commentaries as well. It's something that James and I have done, what we used to do on the main show that we've started doing here. So for $1 a month on our Patreon, you can get those shows. There's at least four a month. Also, there's my movie pitch show that I do. But also, what we want is if you're a Patreon, you can come on. You can come on the main show if you want. Or if there's something you want to come on and talk about, we can do it as a Patreonic special. So all I want is for $1 a month, think about chipping in, joining our Patreon, and you have a voice to be a part of things. Follow the link in the link tree or in the show notes below, patreon.com slash kryptonreport. If you are like Tyler and James and can't get enough super talk, check out these other podcasts. Digging for Kryptonite, Supergirl Radio, The Last Sons of Krypton, The Superboy Legacy Podcast, All-Star Superfans, Superman the Animated Podcast, The Aspiring Kryptonians, Always Hold On to Smallville, The Geek of Steel, and Truth, Justice, and Hope. Remember to check out Krypton Report on all social media platforms. Go to linktree.com slash Krypton Report and find out all of our information. This is Dan Jurgens, and if you want to have a good time, keep listening to the Krypton Report.